when scandals like these occur, you have to look at the most powerful people in the institution and hold them accountable if you want things to change. Welcome to If Grapes Could Talk, your one and only source into the corrupt lives of wine country's elite. And who am I? What is this series? Why am I making it? Well, those and many other secrets I'm about to happily tell. But before we begin, because we're talking about real corruption from real people, we will be touching on disturbing themes. However, I will never show graphic images or go into graphic descriptions. That being said, I may share statistics, describe general trends and patterns, or refer to specific details in order to make my point. So with those warnings out of the way, let's dish. And before we dish, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to everyone that watched the trailer, especially those of you that shared the trailer with your friends. I'm really excited to see what's to come for If Grapes Could Talk. Um, so yeah. Let's actually dish now. Oh, and if you didn't watch the trailer, it's absolutely fine. This will still make sense. And if you did watch the trailer, that is also fine. There won't be too much redundant information. For those who didn't watch the trailer, allow me to introduce myself. Sonoma County locals may know me from being a member of the class of 2009 at Sonoma Academy, from being the owner-operator of Images on the Windsor Town Green for about three years, from my two articles in the Sonoma Gazette, Stop Empowering Predators Like Fapoli, and There's Something Rotten in Sonoma County. Um, and I was also a prospective member of prominent social club Active 2030 back in 2015. But as I hinted in the trailer, before I can really begin If Grapes Could Talk, I need to explain to you how and why I decided to make If Grapes Could Talk. My journey as a Sonoma County news analyst of sorts began when the San Francisco Chronicle journalists Alexandria Bordos and Cynthia Dezigas released their investigation into the multiple allegations of sexual assault against now former Windsor mayor and wine country prince Dominic Fapoli. To me, this was important not because the allegations were news. I had been aware of most of them since 2015. Um, they were important because the people that knew about them and had been trying to do something about them could no longer be written off as gossips. When these allegations first came out, many locals found it odd that the San Francisco Chronicle, which is not a local paper, um, the Press Democrat would be the Sonoma County local paper. But many people found it odd that it was the San Francisco Chronicle and not the Press Democrat that had been the one to put these allegations against Dominic Fapoli on the public record. The LA Times later revealed that the locals had been justified in their suspicions when they revealed that um, Alexandria Bordos, the lead journalist in the San Francisco Chronicle investigation, had actually taken those same allegations to the Press Democrat in 2019, and the Press Democrat had passed. So more on that later, but do remember in the back of your mind that we have evidence that the Press Democrat is a tad cowardly. Now, you can imagine how I might have had a lot of pent-up feelings um, having been aware of the allegations back in 2015 and then not really been allowed to express myself about them until they went on the public record in 2021, I had a lot to say. And one of the things that I was particularly mad about was the social club Active 2030 because I had been a prospective member of Active 2030 back in 2015, and Dominic Fapoli had been one of the club's most prominent members. Now, quickly, Active 2030 is an international club made up of small local chapters. So Sonoma County has multiple Active 2030 chapters in Healdsburg, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, Sebastopol, so on and so forth. Dominic Fapoli was an Active 2030 Santa Rosa number 50, which is notably one of the few um, men's clubs, men's only clubs, um, that are still in existence in Active 2030. Most of the clubs, including the one that I tried out for, was a prospective member for, number 205, um, are co-ed. And so when I was a prospective member for the Healdsburg Club, I was warned by members of the Sebastopol Club uh, primarily 
about not just Fapoli, but really that whole number 50 club. Um, it was just that Fapoli was kind of the worst of them. And the fact that they didn't really do anything about Fapoli kind of was the evidence that the club as a whole was um, skeezy. But, and that's just a, just a little tip of the iceberg of my anger. And we'll get into more of what I had to be angry about. Um, so with just that just with all of that circling, all of those flaming, angry thoughts circling, I was miraculously able to write a really well thought out, well articulated op-ed called Stop Enabling Predators Like Fapoli. Long story short, I was able to get the piece published in the Sonoma Gazette, a community-oriented paper that doesn't really pay its contributors or engage in traditional fact-checking. Think of it as more elevated letters to the editor. All of this happened quite quickly, and I wasn't really sure what to expect from the Gazette. So with my first op-ed, I was actually quite alarmed by the lack of editing that went into it, and ended up asking two of my closest friends to edit it after the editor at the Gazette that I'd reached out to said that it was pretty much ready to go. Like, I'm not saying this to brag, but that article, even as it is, as it is published on their website right now, is a largely unedited stream of consciousness rant. It just, that's what it is. Despite this, my op-ed set records for how many views an article had had on the Sonoma Gazette's website. Um, to quote the editor, the numbers were unreal uh, because typically they get something more like 2,500 views for a really great article and mine had 8,500. And I was actually trying to take a social media cleanse at the time. So I was finding out because people were tracking me down like through LinkedIn or through my old blog where like the last thing I had written about was a bachelor finale. Feedback from the community was clear. They appreciated the fact that I was saying, we're not just gonna hold Fapoli accountable. We need to hold his enablers accountable. We need to hold the professional, social, and political network that supported him, despite how common knowledge the allegations against him were, we need to hold all of that accountable if we want something like this to never happen again. While I was working on the article, further allegations came out against Fapoli. Actually, in a bizarre twist, he tried to accuse Councilwoman Esther Lemus of, eh? um, but then she responded by basically becoming his sixth accuser. Her allegations were the first ones where I felt that, that shilling sensation. I'm about to discuss some specific details of Lemus's allegations, and this is about as graphic as I will get throughout the series. But if even just like some specific details, like techniques, are something that you don't want to hear, um, here's a timestamp of where you can jump to um, once I've edited and I know um, where that is. And as I you know, said in my intro, I'm not going to go into like graphic detail, I'm not going to show graphic images, I don't want to. Everything I'm talking about is already on the public record, um, and so there are links down below to the articles that I base all of my research on if you want to know the specifics for yourself. So Lemus's allegations really rattled me. You know, you really want to believe um, the best case scenario, and in this case, with Fapoli, the best case scenario was that he was like some frat guy that was using a toxic drinking culture um, to get away with stuff. But with Lemus's allegations and the discussion of potential drug use and a tape, that combined with the fact that, remember, I wasn't warned about Fapoli, I was warned about the entire number 50 Santa Rosa club, and just combined with, there, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bonker sauce, not good in the brain feeling to go to a party one night and be told, watch your guys, watch your drink around this guy, he's dangerous, and then go to work the next day and be told this dude is like an outstanding member of the community and you should donate to his campaign fund. To be told that you're, you're the one overreacting, that you find that upsetting. You know, all of that was sort of coming together to feel like, it just, it didn't add up. It didn't make logical sense that Fapoli was a lone wolf. And again, that's just not something, that's not something I want to have to face. 
I very much would like the idea that we can just put all the blame on Fapoli. It would be really nice if we just put the blame on Fapoli. Now that we know and he ruined his career, this is over. Um, but I think we all know that life isn't that easy. So the nature and number of allegations fueled a nagging suspicion of mine that Fapoli didn't work alone. To be clear, I can't prove it one way or the other. That's just my take as a over-informed citizen. Shortly after my article was published, um, the town of Windsor and the town council decided to hold a meeting to decide what to do about the situation. And Fapoli, as mayor, decided to run this meeting. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Fapoli ran his own what should we do about Fapoli's predatory behavior meeting. You may be thinking, what about the councilwoman who was one of his accusers? Um, yes, she had the grace, sense, and dignity to recuse herself. Um, not for polling. This meeting ended up being six hours. And don't worry, I will tell you a lot more about what happened over those six hours in later episodes. The, what's going on in Fabuli land is that no one is coming to his defense. His own brother was calling for him to resign and his family was pushing him out of all of their businesses. And yet he didn't step down until Farah Abraham, former star of Teen Mom, became the ninth woman to accuse Fapoli, and she actually has filed a police report in Palm Springs. I am so sorry. I lied to you. Someone did come to his defense. Robert Strick, um, a prominent um, political lobbyist, one of the most successful under the Trump administration. Yeah, um, so he came out of the woodwork to defend Fapoli and go off again about a sex tape. And the weirdest, I mean, <laughs> the weirdest thing. A we another another weird thing about all of this was that Robert Strick, in defending Fapoli, wasn't denying any of the allegations except for Esther Lemus's, and then was really doing extra work to discredit Esther. So, so Robert Strick and how he's representing himself is just like, oh, hi, my best friend, I'm not denying that he's a serial predator. I just think that it's worse that this one alcoholic lady is lying about him being extra creepier than he actually is. Like, that was Robert Strick's... Like, if I took Robert Strick at face value, that's what he said. That's what he was saying. And even though that that is baloney, like, that is not... That's weird <laughs> and is not to be trusted. Um, it's also like, imagine thinking that that's a defense. For obvious reasons, I had a lot more questions, but the coverage slowed after Fapoli resigned and I had another scandal to attend to. Around this time, a fellow Sonoma Academy alum contacted me to get help essentially doing something about the multiple allegations against Sonoma Academy founding humanities instructor Marco Moroni, and those allegations are now on the public record um, via the Press Democrats. If you recall from earlier in the episode, the Press Democrat didn't cover Fapoli, and that had been interesting. So this alum is um, one of the founding members of the Athena Project. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Athena Project is a group of alum, a formal group of alum that are trying to hold Sonoma Academy, Sonoma Academy accountable um, for what Marco did while he was an instructor there. They're very open about the fact that they do reach out to people and ask for specific kinds of help. And yes, I have helped them. And I think you can understand why, after reading my Fapoli op-ed, they thought that I was someone they could reach out to for help. Through the Athena Project, I did learn about the story that would be coming out in the Press Democrat about the allegations against Sonoma Academy and Marco Moroni. Um, and I decided to write a follow-up piece for the Sonoma Gazette. And this was another unpaid opportunity, but I was okay with that because I had a platform to freely express myself. <laughs> or so I thought. And I didn't just want to cover Sonoma Academy. I wanted to cover all of the things that concerned citizens had brought to my attention following the success of my initial op-ed. And some of this stuff was really chilling, like why don't we know more about the alarmingly high rates of human trafficking in Sonoma County? So here's where things got weird 
Irv that a DC lobbyist going on and on about a sex tape, I guess. If I hadn't planned to write the article in advance, I wouldn't have been ready when the Press Democrat released the story on June 9th, 2021, just under two months after they had started taking flack for the Fapoli coverage. Right, you have to admit that that's not unsuspicious timing. So because of the non-existent editing in my first article, I expected a similar experience with this second article. It was not a similar experience. The Sonoma Gazette, in their infinite wisdom, removed the following paragraph. I personally believe people far more powerful than the Dean of Students or Head of Counseling are ultimately responsible for Marco's reign of terror. Some of the most rich, influential people in the world, not just Sonoma County, have contributed to the school's development. For example, the Board of Trustees has historically included members of the Jackson family, whose patriarch, Jess Jackson, became a billionaire off of the success of Jackson Family Wines. Our only trustee, Emeritus, is a member of the Lassiter family. Notably, multimillionaire patriarch Jess Lassiter stepped down from his job as head of Pixar in 2019 after acknowledging his pattern of sexual misconduct. While no one wants their names associated with a predatory teacher, the stakes of such associations are much higher for such notable families. Inflammatory? Sure. But so was the whole article. So was the first article. These were not hugs and puppies articles. These were fighting words. When I learned the Gazette wanted to take out the paragraph, I communicated that the paragraph was important to me, um, but that I understood if they couldn't run it um, because I understood them to be a small independent paper who maybe just couldn't handle the of dealing with such powerful people. But that, you know, I hoped that we could work together to figure something out. So the Gazette published my article without that paragraph and without my final approval. Thus, my analysis of Sonoma Academy was somewhat hypocritical in the context of my larger point, which has always been when scandals like these occur, you have to look at the most powerful people in the institution and hold them accountable if you want things to change. So at Sonoma Academy, that would be the trustees. And I would like to point out that even though the paragraph may come across as inflammatory, it is actually held up better than you'd think to the casual observer. Besides Dean of Students Ellie Dwight, who was referenced in that my own article, the main staff member who has um, publicly taken flack for the scandal um, is Janet Durkin, the founding head of school. However, if the definition of founding trustee is someone listed as a trustee on the first year an organization files tax documents, then Janet Durkin is a founding trustee. Yet, because most of the time Janet is referred to as a head of school, I think she comes across more as a staff member than as a trustee. But what I can say as a student, Janet Durgan very much to me felt more like, like she was associated with the trustee, like she served the parents particularly the parents that were donors. To me, Janet Durgan's job was to keep rich parents happy so they'd keep donating money. Like you can't have that be the person you throw under the bus and not look at the implications of why that, that person had to be thrown under the bus. Like why the person whose job it was to keep rich people happy had to be the sacrificial lamb. And so the current board of trustees um, seem willing to, um, take a step back and say like, okay, Ellie Dwight, Dean of Students, um, like she ended up resigning and apologizing and I'll get more into that um, in like Sonoma Academy episodes. Um, but they also recently, I'm gonna read this quote, um, they showed willingness to remove Janet Durgan's name from the Guild and Commons building, um, which is a really big deal as well as the statue in the garden at our front entrance. So they took her name off a building and they're taking down a statue of her, um, which as you know, like in rich people world, that's a really big deal. Basically stripping Janet Durgan, the founding trustee of her legacy. So that's that on Sonoma Academy for now. Um, more on them in Sonoma Academy specific episodes, probably like six, seven episodes from now. Um, content warning, biphobia, racism, and that time my Spanish teacher had me write the final.
And like, this is, okay, last thing on this. Even if Janet Durgan like were mere staff, according to Jess Jackson's biographer, they wooed her here like in like Jess Jackson or like his like his helicopter because she and she was like she thought that this was a bit too grandiose and so they wooed her in their helicopter. In my mind, if you found a business and then the person that you hire to run it for you um, allows 34 children to be traumatized at minimum, you're still responsible for the fact that that's who you're hired to like run your organization, right? Like, I'm not alone in that, I don't think. After my paragraph was removed, I took my concerns to Instagram and shared um, the paragraph that had been removed. So another Sonoma Academy alum showed up in my inbox with the following. Rye, I don't think it's relevant that the Jackson family be dragged into this or the Lassiters. Both those families have phenomenal people in them and slandering them isn't conducive to getting justice for the women that were hurt by Marco, nor were they the gate gatekeepers of withholding the women's complaints. Also, their children were your classmates. Before you come in, guns hot, just remember that this is about the hurt women and holding the school employees responsible who didn't take these women's complaints seriously or turned a blind eye. So more of the like blame the staff narrative. Because I hold these beliefs so strongly, the blame the staff narrative in both this IG message and the press Democrat coverage finally got to me. Why wasn't anyone mentioning the trustees, if for no other reason than to reap the spoils of clickbait journalism? I decided to see if I could find financial ties between the board of Sonoma Media Investments, the company that owns the Press Democrat, and prominent trustees, especially founding trustees of Sonoma Academy. And I did, and we will get into that. But for right now, the point, the important point is that while I was on the Sonoma Media Investments website, I discovered that not only did they own the Press Democrat, they owned the Sonoma Gazette. You know, the small independent paper that couldn't be bothered to defend me against printing facts, verifiable facts about rich members of the community. Like I felt betrayal. The dissent declined to apologize for misrepresenting me or correct my article, but the editor did feel the need to tell me on three separate occasions that it is her ass on the line. Um, and in her final correspondence with me, she said she is here for the community, not egos. It's just not credible to me for her to say that her them refusing to fix this situation is about serving the community because the community said that what they liked about my first op-ed was that I wasn't afraid to sugarcoat things when I was talking about prominent families like the Jacksons and the Lassiters and the Fapolis. And then they weren't allowing me to do that in the second op-ed. From there, I reached out to a number of journalists, activists, advocates, just really anyone who would listen to me at certain points to get advice on what I should do. This time in my life had some highs, like reconnecting with some amazing old friends and Williams College alums, and it had some lows, like being ghosted by an editor from Vanity Fair. At the end of the day, I had to launch a YouTube channel to be able to express myself to you, to the people of Sonoma County, or I mean, if you're just a tourist, like, uh, what am I gonna get myself into if I go to Sonoma County? I don't blame you. Uh, <laughs> some of the some of the uh, accusers, some of the police accusers, were tourists. But yeah, at the end of the day, I had to launch a YouTube channel um, to be able to guarantee that I could tell you what I actually think um, without continued misrepresentation. And so you may be wondering like, well then why now? Is there like a major story? Quite frankly, I pushed up the release schedule when I found out that Jeff Okrepke is running for Santa Rosa City Council. Jeff was president of Active 2030, number 50, when I joined in 2015 and was warned that his club that he was in charge of was um, the creepy circus and that Dominic Fapoli was the ringleader. Oh so yeah, Fapoli may have been the ringleader of that circus, but Jeff Okrepke was president of it and it is a slap in the face to every resident of Sonoma County that is reeling from the trauma that Fapoli has put on us. 
that, that anyone from Active 2030 number 50 in particular, but really the whole thing at this point, would run for office. And so in the very next video, which will be released Tuesday, January 4th, and I intend to release on Tuesdays from there on out, we're going into a lot more detail about why Jeff, as well as his um, father, former Windsor Mayor Bruce Okrepke, are really key figures in understanding how Fapoli was able to get away with what he did for so many years. So like, subscribe, all that jazz. Please share this video with anyone that you think would want to know the information in it, uh, any concerned citizens. Until then, you know you love me. XO.